question, but it's quite interesting to see like, all the information about the social events. And I know that like, a lot of you will probably be looking forward to the top draw in quite a while. But before we get to the top draw, there are two days of work that's really what we have come come before to listen to the talks present on our own topic. And I'm very pleased to introduce the first video speaker.
Uh, this brings me to the first set of examples um, on the handout, which uh, uh, in uh, terms they are always aligned, in which the term body or uh, the lexemes are used with regard to uh, political themes of this. English, you have a particular phrase of body politic, so that is uh, present in the first two examples, the American body politic, the uh, uh, body politic, uh, and the concept of Thailand in this politic. Um, and uh, however, also the uh, 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 body uh, metaphors laws that have been translated for Asian products. The body, body, the German nation or the Aryan race in four uh, concept uh, of the heart, in this case not of a particular state, but of a group of states, <coughs> Asian nation, uh, which was quite dominant for a while in the uh, heart or not or whether that heart existed, whether it was dying, whether it was uh, And we also have a slightly more exotic or strange uh, uh, examples like which is the last series of examples Boris Johnson's a Tory MP facetiously deriving his um, I this, this set of examples could easily be uh, in this. So the present principle I did of it as body um, and of political productions or body signals etc. Uh, still relevant, uh, one would even say vibrant and lively <coughs> race kinds of uh, uh, conceptualizations. It's not a mere case of using one old historical phrase like that of the body politic, it generates also things like disemboweling or toenails or whatever. And if someone came up with uh, uh, the metaphor using the earlobe or uh, the fingernails of the politic <coughs> in a way that uh, says something meaningful about political issues, then uh, clearly that would be easily understandable. Uh, in medical theory, uh, over the last 20-30 uh, uh, years, um, the standard analysis uh, of this uh, has become uh, the identification of what is called mapping or names between the source domain and the target domain. This is connected, of course, with names like uh, uh, George Lakoff, Mark Johnson, and Fournier and Turner and the whole so-called cognitive approach to that theory. And we can easily match the, the source and the target domain concepts even in the few times that we have had and say, well, here we have the source domain with all the body aspects that we find in those examples, and then we can easily identify the respective reference in the target domain. Um, now, from the view of the of some strengths in uh, cognitive the theory, that is, as it were, enough. After all, we have identified the source and the target, the aspects. However, as we does political discourse, and from the point of critical discourse analysis, or any discourse analysis, that's of course only half or not even half of the story, because the interesting aspect is, of course, what kind of inferences, what kind of conclusions are drawn from that? Does it mean that Hitler compares the Jews to Barcelona that can and must be eradicated completely? What does it mean that politicians speak about how of Europe being sick or healthy, being close to it, and so on? But, I mean, they don't just use the metaphor in order to introduce some kind of hidden ritual ornament. Uh, nor do they have uh, idiotic classification procedure. Let's, let's use a different category or something like that. So, um, 
as an example of uh, a famous author who dealt with this uh, problem, uh, I quote in some text, uh, famous essay, um, uh, in the your handout you actually have. I by cutting and pasting it works, so I eliminate it's Sontag instead of Soon. So you have Soon there, but of course it's Soon Sontag. On the transparency, I got it right. So G, of course, makes uh, the uh, pertinent uh, point um, in her individual style that, uh, about, in particular, the use of this by uh, Nazis and uh, other political people, she even has the problem of saying she, Susan Sontag herself, once used as a uh, uh, But she says, well, using the cancer metaphor is something that is, well, she says, implicitly just advocates that pleads for a political course of action that can end in genocide, as infamously in the case of Nazi policies, who um, use all kinds of uh, body metaphors, the, uh, the parasite one, the illness one, uh, also the vermin in decomposition uh, field uh, to describe the enemies, and then proceed to implement their own metaphors in political reality. And uh, in order to uh, to go beyond uh, the mere uh, cognitive uh, description, uh, I propose using uh, something uh, more than just uh, mapping the mappings, as it were, in what I call uh, uh, analyzing the metaphor scenario. By scenario, I mean the whole metaphor schema with its presuppositions and inferences that lead to particular conclusions, such as if there is a dangerous illness in the body politic, that illness must be eradicated completely, and we must leave nothing there. Uh, and also, of course, with regard to the relationship between different parts of the body politic, the idea that the head or the heart are somehow more important than a mere toenail. So there is an implicit hierarchy there. You can see that you have these inferences at the level of the source. We all have such inferences about our own bodies, as it were, and what happens to them. And then these inferences also are carried over into the target meaning and uh, lead to very, sometimes very, very specific and very faithful. Uh, uh, and then perhaps forms of action. So theoretical and practical conclusions. And this kind of analysis I will use uh, in the rest of my talk to look at a few examples. I cannot possibly go over all examples of politic uh, metaphor in the course of the two thousand years, because it's uh, at least as old as that. Uh, one can trace it. Um, in the British context, one of the most famous um, early examples is uh, the one that I will uh, present uh, first. Uh, this is uh, from a, uh, a cleric and a philosopher called John Salisbury, um, who wrote uh, a very, uh, uh, very big and in some way strange volume called Polypractice, which is uh, a philosoph philosophical treaty about everything, but it includes a kind of political philosophy and has become famous as such. This John of Salisbury is a historical figure in so far as he was secretary to Thomas Beckett and involved, of course, in the conflict between the English church and the English king, which led to murder of the Christian Cathedral. And um, this John of Salisbury describes feudal medieval society in great terms of the metaphor. Um, 
and he is in a way particularly significant because he speaks in so much detail and he goes hierarchically from the head, the prince, the king, that's the time down to the feet. And the feet are the farmers, the peasants. And in each and every case he explains why he says that when well, our feet, because they are on the ground all the time. Um, as I said, in itself, this is, uh, well, what would you expect from a medieval uh, churchman? It's really conventional and, and conservative. It is very, very hierarchical. So an idea of political hierarchy, hierarchy is very strong in it. Uh, however, there are uh, quite, uh, some quite interesting features that it, in so far, as the uh, this John of Salisbury, um, makes two motions that are quite innovative uh, for the time. One is motivated by his uh, position in the church rather than only in the state. So he does actually of the prince as the head of the body politic, but the head has to be governed by the soul. And the soul, which is somehow related, is the church and the church representing God. So a prince acts without due guidance from the soul, is a head that acts irrationally and, and uh, This, of course, is interesting for someone who was involved in this great conflict between church and state, and this is clearly taken. So the prince may be the head, but he is still he can't do what he wants. He is still under control from it. The second innovative aspect is uh, that even though the feet in the body are lowest of the low, nevertheless, their existence and their function, and their functioning is as essential as they are, and they therefore need protection and caring for and looking after by all the other body parts, including the head. So he makes point of saying, well, the peasants, of course, owe their lives and their existence and all their duties and everything to the rest of feudal society, but feudal society cannot simply say we can do without those farmers or we can treat them badly for. Uh, and he, he goes on for uh, several pages uh, about uh, the replications of this. And he's got this as one of the uh, uh, rather reform minded uh, uh, political thinkers of his time on this uh, subject. Um, oh, uh, John of uh, Salisbury wrote in Latin, so all this is about the corpus magicus and uh, uh, not yet in, uh, in English terminology. Um, now we make a very big jump from the Renaissance to Renaissance and immediately to the most famous with uh, William Shakespeare. And uh, well, messages in the first place, and political messages in the second place, and body politics in the third place. So I will only uh, describe uh, uh, the fingernail of this body politics metaphorical here. Um, it's something that I find very interesting, which the history of ideas people uh, found out and made into a very big hypothesis and half a century ago now, but which I think is an interesting point to consider for this course history of metaphors. Um, in the first place, you have this uh, extended uh, quotation from Coriolanus. Uh, Shakespeare uses a uh, metaphor that he had inherited from the uh, literature traditions, the so-called table of Betty, uh, which goes back to a Soviet fable uh, and so on. Uh, in which the um, uh, body politic in this case of um, is described as uh, a system in which the belly sits in the body and apparently does nothing but just takes in the thing all the time. And the other body rebelled against that belly because they say, well, lazy, uh, just as we complain about this. University administration. The <laughs> which is contained in the uh, well, of course, we 
uh, take everything in, uh, all the nourishment equally distribute them and efficiently manage them for the rest of the body. And without the belly, uh, even though the belly is not in anything by way of our movement or so, without the belly, the whole body would collapse. And therefore, you remain us, not with us, because we are the equivalent of this belly. And then he goes on to the first citizen as the great toad is the lowest place as poor as thou goes foremost. It's out foremost. Uh, maybe that is not his toenail and metaphor completely, I don't know about his um, knowledge uh, of how Shakespeare methods, but I'll put it uh, uh, past him. Um, so, in a way, you could say, well, this is the medical model. You have a hierarchy of body parts, and uh, the ones at the top of this case, the head or heart, are the belly, and the others, what they are, the units are, and are not. Um, however, um, one of the great historians of Tilliot, um, in his bestseller, uh, <laughs> 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 Um, uh, says, uh, uh, proposes the idea that in the Renaissance, what had once been a firm and stable and coherent belief system in the Middle Ages, where the body state analogies were taken 100% seriously and belief in and invested with almost religious certainty that this becomes a, an inventory of measures that everyone can play around. That's, of course, a measure change. Cognitive theory would have a great problem with that, because they think, well, uh, of measures do determine to some kind of thought. The, concept, uh, the history of ideas, and of what what was a firm belief truth, becomes a set of political, political uh, methods that everyone can use in whichever way they like. And now uh, we have uh, evidence for this from Shakespeare himself. So you have, for instance, the first citizen of Coriolanus, the leader of the rebellion himself, using this uh, traditional uh, methods of the king with crowned head, etc., etc. You have in Julius Caesar the whole thing uh, turn around, so no longer is the body the metaphor for the state, but the other way around, the state becomes the metaphor for the body. Uh, and in uh, Richard III, one of the nastiest uh, propaganda uh, uh, followers of the usurper king, Richard III, tries to use the uh, body, uh, length, uh, body metaphor for very uh, transparent. <laughs> Um, propagandistic process in order to fight it uh, against the rightful uh, 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 of the crown, the ones that uh, uh, those uh, two young people of the late Kate uh, who Richard has murdered in the uh, tower. Uh, so they are ignoble plants. Uh, uh, that are grafted from the proper royal stock. But the point is, Richard is not the proper royal stock, and these big noble ants are actually the ones who should be the royal stock in, in, within the um, uh, logic of the play. And uh, certainly, uh, this argument is not a figure that is in any way trustworthy or believed by the audience. So, use of the body politic metaphor here is already announced by the way it is used by this untrustworthy character. <coughs> so, I will leave that here. I, uh, in a way, the, the problem with the, uh, with the great issue of the history of ideas was that it uh, focused on a few canonical great authors, especially great poets. And it's a question that has been asked since uh, several times uh, whether that be representative of something like the public uh, discourse at the time or at any time, and whether something like discourse history should not take into account much more than just that it was top layer 
of the top poetic and philosophical formulations. Now, having said that, I will continue with the um, uh, because there, uh, there are a few uh, famous examples which uh, bring us uh, to the modern um, uh, state of affairs, uh, which will be the, uh, the concluding part. Uh, Susan Sontag, in, in the book, in the um, has put forward the, uh, the further hypothesis um, that the Renaissance was not only sort of this, this age when the belief system about the body, but also when the illness metaphor associated with the body topic became particularly prominent. And she quotes uh, people uh, like what I have here, so Machiavelli in the discourses is Bacon and Thomas Hobbes um, all in, in their <coughs> respective uh, political writings use the idea of a political crisis or crisis as the equivalent of a more or less severe illness in the human body and what to do with that. Uh, uh, specifically makes the uh, observation that the reasons this was mostly about this illness in the politic, body politic being relatively liberal, being uh, a problem of political leadership, but everything was in principle soluble. Um, this can be uh, uh, use of it, uh, where he distinguishes between uh, appropriate and inappropriate ways of managing an illness in the body uh, You have uh, Francis Bacon, where this can be seen in a rather more dramatic way. The rebellions of the belly are the worst, uh, and he uses uh, uh, also the old a result theory of the four humors in the body. Um, when we come to Hobbes' uh, Leviathan, which of course has, has its introduction, the famous extended analogy of the body and the state in the first place, but when we come to uh, the particular chapter, the infirmities of the Commonwealth, um, of which I've just given you one example, it's almost the whole chapter could be quoted by long extended allegorical description of crisis of the state, Hobbes, I think, would already be a, a counter-example to Sufontek's hypothesis, because, as you can see here, the, the uh, thesis of the body politic that he imagines and the cures that are necessary uh, to are pretty radical. So he talks of, uh, for, for instance, the young people reading democratical writers to being bitten by a mad dog, and the only thing you can really do then is the utmost brutal uh, installment of the power of the sovereign uh, in order uh, to, uh, to bound that and completely eradicate any possibility of reading such things, resources, for instance. So, what is already the radical in that, and the idea that this is a kind of a concept of an advisory and consulting being applied to political issues is, I think, a little bit uh, uh, romantic. And uh, on the table four, you have um, the whole, you can, can see, I won't go into the detail, of, but you can see the systematicity and the uh, sheer uh, detail uh, that Hobbes uses in Leviathan to consume uh, politics as a political affair. Uh, and you see uh, an illness, so it has all these, the uh, story of the most serious unlawful conflux of evil humors, madness, disease from poisoning, etc., down to the or, uh, uncomfortable things like biles, when apple steams, uh, and so on. Uh, and likewise, a whole system of uh, political equivalence uh, from sedition 
which destroys the state uh, or threatens to destroy uh, to uh, problems with colonies, etc., etc. Uh, and Hobbes uh, draws already the conclusion that if there is a serious illness of the uh, state, then the uh, is necessary and his idea of the therapy is the firm installment of the better power. Um, that's his preferred option. Um, of course, if there's in the year 1650, well, we can't have a monarch anymore, but that was the time when Trumper was uh, ruling, then a uh, good firm dictator will also be. Jump it goes into the 20th century. Uh, we've already a taste of this uh, in Nazi ideology. Um, this method was the better field was made into a full blown ideological. Uh, if we stick to the sort of standard descriptions, we at least have to assume two types of elements instead of one. It was taken not only as an illness in the body politic as a totally deadly danger to not just the German state but the so called Aryan race and ultimately the whole of humanity. He says verbatim only in German uh, when I'm fighting against the Jew, I'm doing the work of the good. Uh, here we have more than just news of a few um, body politic methods, and we have also more than the use of, say, a standard discourse. What we have here is a quasi metaphysical system of absolute good versus absolute evil, in which Hitler construed himself as the great redeemer, doctor, savior figure who, who has to save the soul of creation, basically. Um, to the conclusion uh, of uh, the argument where um, the table, and I won't go right, I think, to the description of this table, I'm very happy to entertain questions in the discussion, I'd rather sort of have for this time. point I want to make is that we speak of the history of such thing as a body politic metaphor from a discourse point of view, from a critical discourse point of view. It is a problem just to stick with the identification of a particular source domain and just continue it for a thousand years or two thousand years um, edition there which I can show with so and so many texts um, because after all these texts are a different caliber you have the things like a political philosophical treaty we've had uh, texts we have uh, looked in the first instance and uh, also these examples at current political discourse in which uh, 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 little bits and pieces of the tradition are used more or less creatively and we have a truly uh, consistent ideological use in which the metaphor is made into something else namely the ideology that sort of corroborates itself and in the case of the Nazis was then put into practice and put into reality. And it would be problematic to say that someone who uses a body metaphor these days or a illness metaphor uh, or even a strong this is a cancer in the body politic of this and the other is on the same on a par with let's say Nazi discourse or this discourse or with um, uh, discourse in the past. And I think that discourse analysis because it looks not just sort of terminological or ideological traditions as in the traditional historical linguistic frame. And also because it doesn't just look at the cognitive classification and categorization aspect, because it goes into specific texts and they have explicit intertextual references to other texts and describes them in some detail and for instance can identify the closeness of an ideological of this versus 
different types of fuels. Therefore, critical cost analysis is uh, particularly well equipped and able to analyze this cost at its various steps, rather than assuming just because a particular phrase like the quality is being used consistently over a number of years, we automatically have a kind of historical narrative for that. I don't think we can do that anymore. We are not historians of ideas. I think and there is some, something like this discourse analysis is one that can analyze. <coughs> okay, thank you very much. Somewhere in our heads, as this was vision. That, the first set, 
Foucault's archaeology du savoir uh, wanted to do that. But realistically claim that we have it somewhere in our consciousness when we use these metaphors. So there is a certain time limit. Um, but it is quite flexible. I mean, you, you, can, uh, you can become aware of other aspects of it. Um, so um, it, is, it is arguable where the, uh, where the consciousness breaks off. Uh, and what I find particularly fascinating for, for a discourse of political history is to demonstrate empirically certain discourse traditions and where they break off and where they also start again. And uh, so you can, for instance, show that still they start using the racist version of the uh, metaphor field can still be abused as being as using Nazi language and are and then actually translated against it. So there we can show empirically is a discourse memory there for this particular metaphor field. Um, but they investigate it really empirically rather than um, it is wonderful to have a 2,000 year range. It's, it's incredibly impressive. There are some wonderful massive hypotheses on this about what happened in the Renaissance. I find most fascinating to kind of empirically um, offer a rationalizable science. Um, one, one great question you asked. I'd like to ask how you find data. Um, what was your method for selecting the examples that we have here? Um, did you use these course methods or did you read through these texts? What was your criterion for selecting the text? That you well, I have written a of some 20,000 texts, so that's how I did it. The first day, conceptual release and the look at the origin. I have done a few studies also on hopes, etc. And the, the point is that with some of these texts, we need a uh, year's work only to read the uh, random text by hopes or so. So it's a mega, mega perspective. Uh, I'm sort of well uh, equipped for the moment. The last 10 years, as it were, uh, when really it goes over the last 2,000 years, it's really sort of bits and pieces that I have studied and what you have seen. I mean, I could have produced about uh, 20, but 1,000. The quotations they would still have been in the comprehensive. I would ask you. <laughs> <laughs>